It's 10 now. We can start. It's 10. Great. Hi, everybody. My name is Maddie Wilson. I'm with the Garfield Park Conservatory Alliance. We're here today at the Garfield Park Conservatory in the back outdoor garden, and we're going to be taking on a tree ID walk. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and friend, Al Giroux. Good morning and happy Friday, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for our partner walk today. My name is Al DeRue. I am a certified arborist and I have been the Tree Keepers Program Manager for Open Lands for over four years now. I also want to say hello to uh, Tree Keeper Sarah Cortez, who is monitoring the chat from home. How you doing, Sarah? Now, normally if we were doing this in person, we would want this to be a group discussion and not say a lecture. So we want you to ask uh, questions and share comments and stories in the chat feature. And Sarah will relay those to us and we will answer those as needed. We've also probably got a good number of tree keepers on the line who are gonna be able to answer questions too. So please do share, uh, share your stories and ask questions uh, as we go along here today. Um, now I work for Open Lands, which is involved in a great number of uh, activities in, in the region here. Uh, Open Lands was founded in 1963 with the idea that urban areas need open space too. Uh, we're involved in everything from uh, Birds in My Neighborhood, which is a program we normally take students out to learn to identify uh, birds, but it's really also the idea of getting people outside. Um, and uh, we also have things such as uh, building school gardens, where we work with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District and Chicago Public Schools to replace parking lots with gardens. Now, part of that is to retain stormwater, rainwater, uh, on site to help mitigate flooding. Um, so that's a great benefit to communities. And actually, uh, that's one of the benefits of trees, too, is intercepting rainfall. And we're going to learn about the benefits of trees as we go around today. So uh, we're going to get started and walk around. Um, we, we love the Garfield Park Conservatory here. In fact, we've even run the Tree Keepers course here a couple of times, uh, most recently even last summer, uh, 2019. If you would like to learn more about the Tree Keepers course, I invite you to, uh, invite you to visit openlands.org. Um, and our fall, fall course is filled up, but we will run a number of courses next year. Uh, and you can find out all the other sorts of activities we do at Open Lands uh, at openlands.org as well. Um, and so we're gonna get started. We're gonna cover some basics uh, of tree ID and don't worry about uh, trying to remember it all and everything. We are actually recording this uh, and we can share this out. Uh, and it's, it would be too much to try to remember everything about trees. So we'll learn uh, some distinctive characteristics and some general tree ID. And on that note, uh, we've got a beautiful specimen here. Uh, this is an Eastern redbud, a native species. Uh, it is an understory species, so it doesn't get that tall. So it's a great thing to plant if you've got overhead obstacles such as power lines. And we at Open Lands uh, do actually plant this uh, uh, sometimes. Uh, our Open Lands forestry tree, we have planted almost 7,000 trees in the past seven years. Uh, we often do this through something called the Tree Planters Grant. And you can find more information about that at openlands.org, where if you have enough planting spaces and parkways in your neighborhood, you can organize your neighborhoods, apply for a Tree Planters Grant, uh, and uh, We'll be uh, working, we're accepting applications for next spring, and maybe we'll come plant trees in your neighborhood, and we can get community together, uh, build community, get neighbors to know each other. You can meet some tree keepers, meet some open land staff, um, and uh, yeah, like I said, meet your neighbors and get new trees uh, for your neighborhood, because we always need new trees. Um, and so let's start with some basic tree ID. One of the first things we talk about uh, when I try to identify trees, and let's find a branch here, is whether or not the leaf arrangement is opposite or alt it and if it were opposite uh, the leaves would be directly across from each other now you can see here that these are staggered this is what we refer to as alternate most trees we know are actually alternate there's only about a handful that are opposite uh, and we'll get to some of those today uh, there's a nice uh, mnemonic device uh, to remember trees that are opposite uh, we, we call it mad horse buck which is maple ash dogwood uh, horse chestnut and its close relative uh, buckeye there are a couple others but that gets you a real good start uh, so again here these are staggered so if you're not sure what a tree is are the leaves uh, and branches opposite or alternate is a good way to start you also notice a distinctive kind of heart-shaped leaf uh, of this uh, eastern redbud uh, another great uh, id characteristic of this is this really intense orange inner bark as uh, maddie will show you here and another great thing about uh, eastern redbud that makes it um, a great species to plant uh, 
it's about mid-May. It has these absolutely fantastic magenta, like sort of uh, intense pink flowers to it. Um, and so uh, again, native, uh, really beautiful flowers to it. You will see these in various parks around the city and, and we do plant these as well. And if you can uh, pan up, we happen to have, now this tree is on the map later on, but since we're here, we've got to check out this magnificent tall walnut tree here. Uh, that's black walnut behind us. Uh, another native species that can reach, oh, 70, 80 feet tall. Um, and uh, it has a compound leaf as opposed to the simple leaf we saw here with the Eastern red bud. Um, another characteristic about walnut is this very straight central trunk um, uh, that we refer to as uh, X current in growth habit. So a lot of times when we talk about tree ID, we talk about the leaves and the flowers and the fruit, but it's overall growth habit and form um, can be a, a great way to start identifying trees too. Um, and we're gonna take a walk here and talk a little bit more about open lands work. And we're gonna get to some trees. And I wanna uh, give a reminder that um, please do ask questions and comments in the chat and we can uh, share those out and answer those. Um, we are also joined by um, Lucia Whalen, newly minted tree keeper, uh, and uh, works in the communication department at Open Lands. Thank you for joining us today, Lucia. And I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and walk up this way. Hey, um, we had some questions about the red buds and- um... We are. Oh. Hey, Al, can you hear me? So one of the important aspects about Open Lands work- oh, Maybe not. Oh, uh, and what is, what is the question, tree keeper, Sarah? Hi, uh, so we've got a, a couple questions about the red buds and whether they'd be okay in shade and um, how they do in harsh Chicago winters. You know, we've got a couple of great questions, love it. Uh, do Eastern red buds do well in the shade? Absolutely, being an understory species, they can grow underneath big, tall, say, oak trees. Uh, I can think of a good example of that up in Gompers Park on the northwest side where we did a tree walk in August. Um, and you had a number of beautiful eastern red buds that were thriving underneath 100, 200 year old oak trees. Uh, and does the eastern red bud survive the Chicago winters? Well, it, it is native, so it will, uh, it will overwinter just fine. Uh, about the one knock on uh, eastern red buds, they don't necessarily live all that long, but still a very pretty uh, tree with um, many seasons of color between the, the, the flowers in the spring, the, the really cool orange bark in the fall, the really cool heart-shaped leaves in the summer. So really a tree for all, a tree for all seasons. Thank and you. And up here, uh, keep the questions coming. Uh, those are good questions there. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Open Lands advocacy work. We do quite a bit of advocacy work at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, locally, we are trying to uh, help pass an urban forestry advisory board here in Chicago. And we had a number of tree keepers uh, talking to their aldermen about the importance of that. Thank you for that. Thank you for all the aldermen. We're up to about 15 aldermen who want to co-sponsor that. Uh, and that will be really important, not only as we plant new trees, which we always need to do, we also need to protect and care for and prune uh, our existing trees in order to help them reach maturity to provide the maximum benefits uh, that they have. Uh, such as the ample shade that trees provide to help with cooling costs. Um, and, you know, trees also, we think about humans so often, trees also provide a lot of habitat for wildlife. Oaks, for instance, a bur oak, for instance, uh, provides habitat for hundreds of animals and in, uh, insects. So uh, really important to think not just about the humans, but how trees are really important to the wildlife have. Even here in Chicago, we have in abundant wildlife. Now we've just entered the aspen grove here. Um, this is uh, a tree you, you will find uh, in abundance in the Rocky Mountain states. In fact, uh, you think of towns with names like Aspen, Colorado, or even Golden, Colorado, it's a reference to the really golden yellow um, color these get in the fall. Uh, aspens actually propagate through the roots. Uh, and so uh, a lot of times if you see a giant, even a giant hillside or mountainside of aspens, a lot of times that's one single organism. Uh, another characteristic you'll see about aspens as Maddie kind of pans up the trunk, is you'll see little dots here. And these are actually lenticels, which help with gas exchange. Um, and so it almost like, you can almost think of it as helping the tree breathe. 
Uh, one notable thing about aspen leaves, if we can, they're starting to lose it a little bit. Um, in general, so this is a simple leaf. Uh, when we do see a compound leaf, it'll have multiple leaflets. So we've got a simple leaf here. It's actually got a, a little bit of a tooth margin, which is a little hard to see at the moment. Um, and when we talk about the leaf margin, we're talking about this outer edge here. And so you can't really kind of see the toothed uh, margin here. Uh, another cool thing about uh, aspens is that it has a flattened petiole, which uh, it'll give you kind of the rustling sound in the wind. So we often think of trees as visual appeal. Sometimes we get audio appeal out of trees too. And what, as it flutters in the wind like that with that flattened petiole, as you can kind of see there, it'll actually photosynthesize on both sides of that leaf. Uh, and so uh, we've got this nice aspen grove here. I actually have seen a couple of new aspen trees uh, planted in my neighborhood in parkways. So uh, in order to uh, help uh, diversify our urban forests, um, uh, Bureau of Forestry has even started planting aspens here. Um, and uh, diversity is really important because in years past, we have planted too many of the same types of trees. I'm thinking of like uh, the American elms, which lined our streets decades and de decades ago. And then when Dutch elm disease came around, we wound up losing 90% of those species. You will still find some American elms in Grant Park, uh, downtown Chicago, and some of our suburban communities, and here and there in the neighborhoods. But by and large, we planted too many of the one tree, and then we wound up losing a lot of those. Uh, we learned our lesson again when we overplanted silver maples and Norway maples and honey locusts uh, and green ash and white ash in the wake of uh, when we lost all those uh, American elms. Uh, and then we saw the, the Asian longhorn beetle came in and took out a lot of our maple trees. And actually a lot of our silver maples and Norway ma maples that survived are, are really at kind of old age now. You'll probably see this in your neighborhood. Norway maples and silver maples can be found all over the place. And we're starting to lose a lot of those. So we're losing a lot of our canopy. So we're really trying to uh, plant a wider variety of trees uh, than we once did. Uh, we lost most of our ash trees to the emerald ash borer. Um, and so uh, we, we're, we're starting to finally learn the, uh, the value of diversity. Not only species diversity, age diversity is important. We don't want all of our trees to be the same age in the same place. So we want varying heights. Um, and I'll tell you what, if we pan to my left, we've got a couple of great trees on the horizon. If we get up a little higher, we can see the sycamore. See some beautiful fall color. Um, just fantastic color. The kind of pale green trees you see in the background there are catalpas, which are another really common tree. In fact, they, they're all over Logan Boulevard for those of you who live there or happen to travel through there. Uh, they are native. They are very hardy urban tree. They'll take the salt, they'll take the pollution. They're very vigorous. They have giant heart-shaped leaves. And in fact, they have a pod on them uh, uh, several, several inches long. So sometimes they get the nickname of the cigar tree. Um, but uh, and they're kind of, kind of these curving sort of branching structure that I think almost gives it kind of a gothic feel. And tell you what, if we pan even just to the, the right of the catalpa, off in the distance, if you can see the white branching there, uh, that's actually a sycamore, which is the, just about the largest native species east of the Mississippi. Uh, can reach easily 100 feet and have a really wide spread as well. Sycamores have a very large coarse leaf which allows it to intercept a lot of rain during storms. That's especially important as we see more intense storms with more frequency, a little bit of a one-two punch with increasing climate change. So having trees with large surfaces and rough leaves allows it to intercept more rainfall, which will help with our uh, flooding situation. And to, oh, maybe we can hear it, if we can hear the, uh, the rustling of the leaves. Oh, we had some good questions about the aspen. Oh, that uh, rustling is so intense, it almost sounds like a CTA train rolling by. <laughs> Al, can you hear me okay? We have a train going by, and when there's a train, we can't hear you. So okay. can you repeat your question, Sada? Al, so we've got a good questions about the aspen. Somebody asked, um, how do you tell the difference between an aspen and a birch? And what are the best growing conditions for an aspen? What are the best growing conditions for an aspen? Uh, well, they certainly grow all over the, uh, the slopes of the Rocky Mountains. Um, birch, we tend to find in low wet areas along river banks, or you'll see them in, uh, around the lagoons we have in the various parks here. Um, and uh, while, the, uh, while the bark of, say, uh, 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 some birches and, and um, uh, the aspen here is similar, the leaf shape is very different. 
the aspen leaf is much more circular um, where the uh, birch leaf, and we're going to see a birch later on, is a little bit more almost like an arrowhead shape. The, the margin, again, the outer edge of the leaf of a birch is uh, a much more like a, a deeply serrated like a saw. Well, well this is two that's not quite as intense. But really, in terms of the leaf shape, the aspen leaf is much more circular. Uh, I think off the top of my head, the best way I can describe uh, birch leaf is a little bit more uh, kind of uh, wider uh, towards the base and the narrower up front, kind of sort of sort of like an, uh, an arrowhead. And we are going to step down out of the aspen grove. We, we can't do a tree walk without talking about oak trees, because oak trees are so important to uh, northeastern Illinois and obviously elsewhere, too. Um, they're, they're part of our, our tree heritage, if you will. And we're going to go down and see a bur oak tree. In fact, uh, Open Lands considers a bur oak tree so important, we've actually made it our logo here. Now, if you want to think of a prairie where you have kind of a broad expanse of natural grasses, and then one huge tree that's really wide, maybe even wider than it is tall, there's a good chance that's a bur oak. So why don't we go ahead and, uh, go ahead and find ourselves a bur oak. Uh, normally, this isn't quite as... Uh, <laughs> Um, covered with uh, plant life here, so this is great to see. We're just going to make our way down here and find the oak. And as I mentioned earlier, bur oak supports several hundred species of birds and insects. So incredibly important foundational species for prairie. Ah, here we go. We've got a nice little walkway to come down here. Well, I'll tell you what, before we get to the bur oak, we're gonna stop by and see these uh, beech trees. Uh, beech are also native. You don't really see these in the region because they don't make good street trees. Uh, they have low, very dense branching structure, lateral branching structure. Uh, and so they really don't make good street trees because that doesn't allow for very good visibility. The only ones I can think of off the top of my head that I've seen as parkway trees is up in Saganash, somewhere about Cicero and, and Bryn Mawr. I've seen some nice big birch trees there. Uh, I'm sorry, beech trees, not birch trees. Uh, and so this is American beech. One of the, a uh, couple of really easy identifying characteristics. Let's get that into the shade here. So uh, remembering opposite versus alternate. Um, this here, you can see the leaves are staggering a little bit. So this is uh, alternate branching structure. You can see these really uh, intense, narrow, uh, know, brown, almost like mini cigar shaped buds. That's a real good uh, ID characteristic for, uh, for beach here. I'll get the leaves out of the way there. This kind of have a little bit of a wavy margin. And another real good characteristic uh, ID feature for beach, not birch here, beach, the smooth like elephant skin trunk here. Real classic uh, of beach. Uh, so this is American beach, which is native. You will see uh, a lot of different varieties. Like if you see a beach tree that's wrapped around an arbor, say, or has a weeping habit, growth habit, where it's uh, uh, not very tall and the branches kind of cascade down. Uh, all of those really kind of fancy variety of beaches are actually uh, European. Uh, so they're closely related, but if it's kind of a natural like this, it's American beach. And if it's fancy or has a really interesting uh, um, uh, growth habit to it, uh, such as the weeping uh, 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 habit form, those are all uh, European beaches. And as such, those European beach varieties make great uh, ornamental highlights. And so tell you what, why don't we keep walking? I really do want to find uh, that Baroque. So we've got a nice kind of stand of of American beech here. These are only been in the ground for maybe three or four years, I think, Maddie, and they look great. They're really filling in. Yeah, that sounds about right. I do want to say I'm really impressed with your ability to walk backwards. So I put that on the <laughs> Lots recording. Lots of practice. Lots <laughs> of practice. I can write upside down too from uh, my years of working with students. So um, actually, as we walk towards the Baroque, you'll see in the distance uh, some really cool fall color. Uh, those are actually some maples. Those are Freeman maples. You can see that bright red color. And while they do provide that excellent kind of fire red fall color, um, um, these are actually hybrid maples. They are uh, Freeman maples, which is silver maple cross red maple. Uh, and this was developed because we wanted that really cool red color from the red maple, a uh, really great fall color and then the fast growth from the silver maple. Unfortunately, we've kind of really overplanted these and we don't re really recommend planting these anymore. 
Uh, there, there's just too many of them out there. And while they do provide this, they also have problems with their branching structures a little too, uh, the branches are really tight together, which we kind of refer to as being redundant. And careful of the thistle. Tell you what, we're gonna walk around and I do see our burr oak now, so. I'll make our way here. Sorry, I'm not walking backwards. I uh, hope I don't disappoint anybody out there. And as we come up on the burr oak here, um, it is a member of the white oak group, um, as differentiated from the red oak group. And the white oak group has a rounded tips to the lobes as we're gonna see as we get up close here. Whereas the red oak group has pointed tips to lobes. And we, I don't know if we're gonna see a member of the red oak group here, but so, Beautiful big bur oak. Bur oak can live several hundred years old, hundreds and hundreds of years. So again, a simple leaf. Uh, you'll see a compound leaf later on. Uh, one way to so again, we talked about the rounded tips to the lobes here. So this is what we refer to as the lobes. And these spaces between the lobes we refer to as sinuses. A little give you a little bit of tree talk there. Uh, and one way to tell a bur oak is it has it's really full on the far end of the leaf, away from the uh, away from the leaf bud here. So it's really full there, and then a really deep sinus about halfway um, uh, halfway down the leaf. That's a real good sign you've got a burr oak. Uh, oak trees also readily hybridize. So a lot of times if you see something that like, it kind of looks like burr oak, it kind of looks like swamp white oak, it's a real good chance it's part of both. So oaks uh, cross hybridize uh, very readily uh, uh, within the white, white oak group or the red oak group. Real common one is burr oak uh, and swamp white. And as another characteristic about bur oak, you can see even at a young age here, starting to develop these really thick ridges. That's a, an evolutionary um, development that helps it withstand fire, because fire is important for, for prairie uh, health. And so an oak tree can, can withstand the fire that's important for, uh, for prairies. Uh, fire uh, helps eliminate invasive species, but native species have deeper roots and therefore can withstand that. And even on, the, uh, even on the branches there, you can see the thick, thick uh, ridges. Uh, even the small branches, you can see the thick ridges on these uh, branches. We do plant quite a number of uh, uh, burr oak. Uh, we at Open Lands, about 50% of the trees we plant are oak. We plant white oak, burr oak, swamp white, uh, red oak, chinkapin, um, uh, swamp white, and even shingle oak. Uh, and we're gonna see a swamp white oak later on. I'll tell you what, why don't, we, uh, why don't we wander around and let's head out this way so we can get to the path uh, a little bit easier. And so we, oh, we've got a number of burrow here. This is great. So burrow can reach, oh, 80 plus feet tall and can be easily as wide. So uh, it's not uncommon to see a burrow oak that's wider than it is tall. I can remember one at a park I used to play Frisbee golf in. Uh, it had a lateral branch that was probably pushing three feet in diameter. It was really, really impressive. And uh, as we're walking along here, I, I do want to uh, remind everybody, please, please ask questions, share your stories. Maybe you have an interesting story about a bur oak or another oak. And I'll tell you what, if we pan to my left, we can start to see that heart shape of the uh, catalpas here. I've got a couple of catalpas in the parkways. That's pretty common. Uh, again, uh, being a tough urban tree, we did plant quite a number of catalpas. Uh, and you'll see them kind of twisting and curving like that. Uh, and they do just fine. Sometimes you'll even see uh, catalpas with big cavities in them. And they're so tough, they don't, they don't even really mind that all that much. So we're improvising our walk here a little bit. That's OK. We can update that tree list um, and map. So uh, we did share out at one point a map of trees and a list of trees on this walk. And so uh, I invite you to take a look at that. And maybe someday you can uh, come here and take a walk for yourself practicing social distancing and wearing a mask, of course. All right, we're back on the parkway. Hey, uh, we've got a question about um, the best oak species. I just noticed a new tree I haven't seen here before, so I will definitely add this to the list. Hey, this uh, is a tulip tree. 
Um, you can really easily tell why it's called a tulip tree. Let me drop the bur oak leaf here real quick. So the outline of this leaf, if you follow the margin, if you will, looks really a whole lot like a tulip, right? Hence the common name tulip tree. Another distinctive feature of tulip trees is this kind of duckbill bud, if you can see that. Um, now this, is, this tree is the state tree of Indiana. It gets absolutely huge there. Uh, I sometimes go camping down in Indiana. I've seen some of these that are four foot diameter. Um, just really massive, easily 100 feet tall. Uh, they're a very well behaved tree in that they have that strong central leader, a main trunk, um, uh, again, which we refer to as X current in growth habit. Now, a tree that doesn't have a strong central leader like a tulip tree or walnut tree that we saw earlier, and more of a broad spreading crown, we refer to as D current. Uh, and so that's, again, another way we can kind of describe that. So you see a little bit of yellowing here. Um, Tulip tree, we tend to think of as a little bit more southern, but with climate change, these are trees we're starting to plant because they're going to handle hotter summers. Uh, and if you do see a little, I think this is just fall color setting in. Sometimes you'll see them yellowing a little bit, uh, and often that's just uh, it's, it's just adapting the soil, or it's, it's not quite happy with the soil. Nonetheless, you will see these around. I think I've even seen a couple of new tulip trees in my neighborhood. Uh, and if you are ever in Indiana or Kentucky, you'll see absolutely gigantic tulip trees. So why don't we cover some ground? I think we'll probably find some interesting trees along the way. So um, while we walk to the next set of trees, um, for those of you who haven't been to the conservatory before, or maybe haven't explored outdoors, um, we are open again for outdoor visits um, through November 15th. And so if you go on our website, garfieldconservatory.org, you can book a visit and we have 10 acres of gardens outside. Great. And we've come across one of these species that is opposite in branching structure. So this is a buckeye. And if you can, let me clear a little room here. Um, now buckeyes lose their leaves pretty early in the fall. So there's, there's nothing unhealthy about this tree. But if you can kind of see how the leaves here are opposite or directly across from each other, I shouldn't define opposite by using the word opposite, right? So they're directly across from each other so this is what we refer to as opposite branching structure. Again, that mnemonic device to help you remember trees with opposite branching structure is a mad bucking horse, maple, ash, dogwood, uh, buckeye, which is this, and horse chestnut, a close relative. Another cool thing about this species, well, number one, uh, it's got this pretty big uh, terminal bud here. Uh, and so that's another easy way to, if it lost its leaves, you could see that and say, okay, you know, I see the opposite branching structure. I see a big fat terminal bud. I might just have myself a buckeye. Uh, there are a couple of different varieties of these planted. Uh, have really nice fall color. I'm sorry, really nice big showy flowers uh, late May, early June. Uh, and depending on the fall color or the spring flower color, uh, you can tell what kind of variety is. And another reason I wanted to stop to check this out is um, we have talked about, we've seen some trees with simple uh, leaf, uh, a simple leaf. This is an example of a compound leaf. All of these are actually individual leaflets um, coming from one, um, one bud, if you will. This is what we refer to as palmately compound. I think you can, uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. So it's got five little leaflets here. So uh, pretty cool uh, type of buckeye. Uh, it's got this kind of broken sort of grayish bark here. Um, and so, yeah, you will, you will see these in, in parks great spring color for the flowers big showy flowers and buckeyes uh, and horse chestnuts that is a i think that's a that's a, a big mature hackberry actually it's just from the distance it's hard to tell the leaf we are going to see a hackberry a little bit later on actually so why don't we keep on trucking here how do we have time for a question Oh, absolutely. This is a great time for questions because we've got a little bit of a walk. Actually, uh, while I'm saying that, I'd be having answers. You can see a big uh, mature walnut tree over my left shoulder here. It's a big, broad, spreading crown. Provide a lot of shade. It's even hard to grow things under walnuts. And let's, uh, let's hear some questions. So there was an interesting one about the best oak tree or maybe just any tree that will grow well in city sidewalk cutouts. You know, those... Uh, Parkways, little, yeah. Right. Or, the, um, or tree pits? Yeah, like, right, the cutout side uh, on the sidewalks. 
I've always wondered how much space there actually is underneath the, the ground there to for trees to grow. Uh, we'll, we'll stop here. We're going to see a sumac later on, but we'll check out this amazing fall color in the sumac here. This was built to kind of mimic the way, I'll get to the question in just a sec. <laughs> um, often uh, sumac is what we call a pioneer species. So after a disturbance or a fire, the soil has been um, you know, kind of, uh, just disturbed in some way. You'll see sumac will be one of the first thing that grows in and it forms thickets like this, uh, where a whole grouping of them. Uh, and so they've kind of done this to kind of mimic that uh, and beautiful, beautiful fire red color on these sumac. As a matter of fact, while we're here, and I will get to that question, I promise. Um, so we just saw the palmately compound leaf uh, on the buckeye. This is actually what we refer to as pinnately compound, meaning it's got um, a, a, a bunch of leaflets here, all arranged in kind of a line, if you will, as opposed to that palm shape. So this, this is what we refer to as pinnately compound. Later on, we're gonna see something that's pinnately, uh, bipinnately compound where it's got a rachii here and then also another branch and then branchlets uh, or leaflets. And we will see that later on. I'm gonna keep that because that's, that's pretty awesome fall color. So if you're on a train, let's say, and you're cruising through the countryside and, and you see down the slope, especially this time you see here, you see something like that, real good odds that that's sumac. Uh, again, it, uh, you find railroad tracks, all sorts of disturbed uh, areas like that. So the question was asked, uh, what kind of trees make good parkway trees or trees for uh, the tree pits or the, um, there's not much uh, soil volume. It's a little muddy, good. That way I don't fall down. <laughs> ah, we'll just walk around. And so uh, you bring up a good point. It's, it's really important to have room for the tree roots. And so people are starting to reconsider these five by five uh, tree pits that we've, uh, uh, put in you know commercial areas or downtown areas um now for those you, you just want a very hardy tree but we're starting to reconsider that if you give a tree more room for its roots it's going to have more uh, uh more room for the roots and a better chance to reach uh, its full height uh as far as parkway trees go often parkways don't drain very well and so you want trees that are going to handle wet uh, conditions, swamp white one, uh, swamp white oak is one we plant quite a bit. Uh, another one, did we lose it? Okay, bear with us people, we got a little uh, technical difficulties and while we're working on that, let's... Uh... We can still hear you, Alice, you want to Oh, great, keep great. Thank you, uh, thank you for letting us know that, uh, Sarah. We have, we have a swamp white oak. Hello, we have to stay down. Okay, we're good. Yeah, yep, sure enough. Uh, if we Ready crawl to... on under here, first of all, swamp white oak has a uh, rounded tips to the lobe, so it's a member of the white oak family. You can see kind of that rounded tip there. There we go. Another real easy ID for swamp white oak if we get under here. You see this peeling bark on the uh, underside of branches? Real, real good characteristic for uh, for swamp white oak. Again, we do plant quite a number of these. We plant these in parkways because, uh, as you can guess, with a name like swamp white oak, uh, it'll handle wet conditions, low conditions. Um, in the Latin, uh, swamp white oak is Quercus for oak, bicolor, bicolor meaning two colors, and it's a reference to the strong color contrast between dark green top of the leaf, light green underneath. Uh, in the fall, you can't quite see that as much. So in the Latin, a lot of times Latin names can, can give us information about that. Uh, that's, that's not a good example of that. Thank you. Uh, so dark green on top, light green underneath, hence Quercus bicolor, two color, uh, swamp white oak. And if we could see an acorn, it's also got a long stock on the acorn. I don't know if we'll necessarily see that here, but really if you can remember this peeling bark on the underside of the branches, um, real good, real good characteristic for, uh, uh, ID characteristic for swamp white oak. And do we have time for a question now? Oh, yeah. right. oh gosh, we got tons of time. Oh, well, 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 what do you know? We do have a member of the uh, red oak group here. So I mentioned earlier that white oak group has rounded lobes. And I forgot about this one here. 
This is a member of the red oak group where it's got pointy tips. So again, the lobe here and a pointy tip. So we get a member of the uh, red oak group here. I'm gonna actually gonna go out and I'm gonna say that this is a pin oak. And again, so the sinus is here, pointy tips to the lobes, member of the red oak group. And I believe we've got ourselves a pin oak here. Um, you won't see a, a whole lot of pin oak on the Northwest side of Chicago where I live because it really does not handle clay soils very well. Um, and so while I did see a good number of these up in the uh, Clayton Woods where I was doing some restoration uh, on Sunday, uh, you won't see them in city streets uh, on the northwest side. You'll see them all over, uh, more, more on the south side, south suburbs, and even going east, it's considered a, a really solid workhorse tree. Uh, it just says, you know, uh, uh, the site is so important for, uh, for a tree. But uh, great to see we have the contrast between a member of the white oak group here and the red oak group. And we're going to go check out uh, Sycamore here. So you may see, uh, yeah, we'll get to that. So uh, Sycamore native, uh, again, we saw a big one in the distance there. They get absolutely huge. One of the biggest trees in the Eastern Forest. Now you may see this and say, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with that tree. What happened? This is uh, actually natural. It's actually part of the appeal. Um, uh, and uh, it has a close relative, which is called the London plane tree. Uh, and the best way to tell those apart is that the sycamore leaves are a little bit bigger. And the fruit, if we can see the, the little kind of, uh, eh, we're not, uh, we won't really see them. If they're hanging, hanging singly, it's a sycamore. And you see sycamore starts with us, single starts with us, a nice little mnemonic device there. Um, and actually I see two, two hanging from the same, um, the same kind of stock there there. So this is actually London plane tree, which I had kind of suspected because these leaves are a little too small to be sycamore. So if you can see straight up there, we've got two on one. Can't really see it. Uh, well, you just have to take my word for it again. Not, not leading you astray today, people. Um, and so here we got a London plane tree. And one issue we have with trees, this tree isn't incredibly healthy. Um, it's got some damage at the trunk, quite possibly a lawnmower or something kind of bang into it. So one of the reasons we love mulch is mulch can kind of give trees a protective barrier to keep lawnmowers and weed whackers and, and other things away from the trunk. Really want to protect the trunk, especially of young trees. So one of the many reasons we love trees and love to mulch trees. So uh, we've got another beautiful walnut specimen straight up ahead. You see again that strong central leader, very straight trunk, often not having a lateral branch for many feet. You can see one was pruned here. In fact, that was a good pruning cut because you can see the, the wound wood is starting to steal over that, uh, that pruning cut. The trees don't heal the way that you and I do. Uh, trees actually seal over wounds. Uh, in arborist speak, they refer to it as coated, the compartmentalization of decay in trees. So it's really just kind of kind of wall off that cut. It's never truly going to heal. So we say that trees uh, heal, but not seal. And uh, another characteristic of walnut is thick ridge bark here. I'm actually a huge fan of walnut trees. I have some beautiful specimens on Pulaski around the corner from me that are like 70 feet tall. Another, uh, the walnut fruit, which is prized by animals, has a really distinct kind of musky smell, which I, I think it's, I actually really like these things. Squirrels and animals love these. Uh, I actually have my sister uh, makes, uh, makes dye from walnuts. Now the walnuts that we eat are actually English walnuts grafted onto our native uh, black walnut here, the Juglans nigra um, in the Latin. Um, and so, uh, yeah, good number of specimens. You will see these, there's a little bit of a concern of uh, a disease called thousand cankers disease that's hitting walnuts. But since we don't have walnut trees one after the other, the way that we used to have ash trees and elms, uh, we don't expect it to kind of decimate. Uh, and it hasn't hit the area, but it's just a, a disease of concern called th thousand cankers disease. Um, I'm gonna actually hang on to that. So again, great uh, walnut tree here. And uh, we saw a hackberry earlier, and I was gonna wait until we saw this one here. Um, if we, oh, we can get to a one distinctive characteristic, um, 
can see kind of the overall kind of sort of vase shape to this. Hackberry was actually once in the Elm family and was recently reclassified, but Elms have that kind of classic um, shape or, or habit, if you will, growth habit. You can see a little bit of that here. Another characteristic of Hackberry, uh, now sometimes bark isn't a great uh, uh, ID for really young or really mature trees. It's got kind of these warty ridges. And if you go out and find hackberries, and actually they're pretty common, because again, this is another native hardy tree. It'll take the salt, it'll take the pollution. Uh, almost guarantee you'll find some hackberries in parkways or parks where you live. Uh, these kind of warty ridges to the, the bark, uh, these kind of vertical kind of broken plates to it. Uh, it's a good mature specimen. And uh, hackberries also get something called uh, uh, nipple gall, which is uh, um, just these little bumps that appear on the leaves. Uh, it's kind of gone now. That's actually uh, pretty benign. So if you see that, it, it looks kind of like, oh my gosh, something must be wrong. And it's really just kind of a little bug uh, burrowing there. One characteristic of hackberry, this is actually a compound leaf, um, is it's got an asymmetrical base to the leaf. So the base of the leaf, like closer to the branch here, closer to the, uh, the bud, so kind of asymmetrical in that it's wider on one side and, and uh, not as wide on the other. And then it comes to kind of this point here. So uh, actually kind of sort of looks like an elm leaf. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it was really easy to see why it was categorized in the elm family for so long. So kind of the asymmetrical base to the leaf there. So hackberry and uh, it does get a tiny little like green fruit stone which are edible. Um, and uh, great, let's go check out. You know what, we have yet to see a deciduous conifer. Oftentimes we generally think of trees as either being deciduous, like our oaks, uh, broad leaves, and they lose their leaves in the winter, or they're evergreen, such as our pines, spruces, and, and firs. We don't have a whole lot of native evergreens, um, uh, I should say conifers, which is kind of where I'm getting to. So we generally think of as, as conifers as evergreens and broad leaves as deciduous. It's not quite, that's mostly true, but not exactly true. There are something called deciduous conifers. Conifer just means cone bearing. It, it creates a cone, like a pine cone, like you're thinking. And, and deciduous means it loses its leaves every year. So um, we're gonna go check out a deciduous conifer. Uh, they, you don't see a whole lot of them. Uh, you do see them on occasion. And uh, can we get through? We can get through there, right? We're special. We're just gonna sneak on by here. So this barrier is up to help with one-way traffic, but we will just go over it. It's just about 10.45 as a heads up. 10.45, great, thank you for that time check, Tree Keeper Sarah. So uh, I'm gonna respect that this is closed, um, which I'm sure everybody appreciates. This is here is a larch, not a particularly common tree, it's an Eastern larch. And it's got these little individual needles here. And again, it will turn a, kind of a yellow color in the fall and it will lose these needles each year. So again, it create, it makes a cone. So it's a conifer, loses its leaves every season, uh, every year. Uh, so it's deciduous. Uh, two other more common deciduous conifers you will see are John Redwood and Bald Cypress. I meant to bring up Bald Cypress earlier. Think of it as growing in swamps, Southern Illinois, all through the South. That makes for a great parkway tree because it can handle even perpetually wet situations. Uh, we've got another swamp white uh, oak tree here on the left. This is actually the one that's on your map. Um, and so I just happened to see that other one, but here's the swamp white that's uh, on, the, uh, on the map. And so uh, you will see bald cypress uh, in your neighborhoods and parkways on occasion. Uh, slightly less common, you will see uh, uh, John Redwood. They're pretty similar looking. And let's cut this way. Um, I do, do know of one Don Redwood in my neighborhood. Don Redwood and, and Bald Cypress are pretty similar looking. Um, we're gonna check out another uh, native species that we plant, especially it's kind of more of an understory shade tolerant species. This is a uh, um, commonly referred to as hop horn bean, although depending on where you are, the common name uh, gets called something else. So we generally, re we like to recall, refer to it by its, uh, by its Latin name, just call it Ostraya or Ostraya virginiana. Uh, and so it doesn't grow particularly tall. It is a member of the birch family. You can see Betulaceae there. 
that's a member of the birch family. And the leaf actually even, it kind of looks like a birch leaf actually. It's got that real uh, doubly serrate uh, margin. You see it's almost like two levels of, of saw teeth, if you will. So doubly serrate margin on that. And if we see, um, it has really cool flowers on them that, that look like hops, hence the, the common name hop horn beam. Uh, and if, if you do see them, you'll, you'll, just, you'll just know it right away. So we do plant this uh, on occasion in open lands, especially if you've got an overhead power line or something where you don't want a tree growing to that. What we generally refer to as having the right tree in the right place. And so you don't want to plant a tree like a, um, a willow or a cottonwood or something that's going to grow huge underneath the power lines. So something like this, really cool distinctive bark on this as well. Um, I remember seeing quite a number of these when I was down in Southern Illinois for the eclipse a couple of years ago. Uh, and so yeah, native. And tell you what, let's kind of hang left and uh, keep our social distance away from the uh, people enjoying the Garfield Park Conservatory here. Hey Al, do we have time for a question? Oh, we always have times for questions, uh, Tree Keeper Sarah. Someone asked, um, where can we get trees to plant? Um, and if you could talk a little about uh, nurseries. Um, and you know, I, I can't really talk about individual nurseries because I can't be seen playing favorites. Uh, we at Open Lands, we've bought a good number of trees from uh, Possibility Place, which is a nursery in the south suburbs. Um, our uh, fellow uh, uh, certified arborist, uh, Tom Ebeling, who's uh, out uh, working on tree planting right now, uh, he handles our tree planting operation, so I'm not as much as an expert as, as he is, and he really is an expert. Um, but so we do get a, a number of trees there. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so I, I can't particularly talk about that. Was, was there another part of that question that I, that I missed there? Um, I, I'm wondering myself, um, you talked a little bit about biodiversity um, and trees in the city. How many, um, uh, how many species do, uh, of trees get planted in Chicago? And what are your recommend, recommendations for the type of trees to plant right now? Uh, well, for specific recommendations, well, we would want to know your soil type. Uh, and are there any overhead uh, um, considerations? So I, I can't say, you know, plant this one type of tree. Uh, we plant a lot of different oak trees. As we saw, we plant some of those Ostrya. Um, we plant some lindens. We plant a lot of Kentucky coffee tree, which we're going to see probably to wind up the walk. Uh, we plant some uh, serviceberry, which we're also going to see. I do want to stop and talk here. We've got a, another tree that's common in Indiana and Michigan. This is actually pawpaw. So you can see it's a little bit wider towards the end of the leaf as opposed to the base. This gets a really uh, unctuous fruit to it. Um, and hence the common name, uh, Indiana banana. In fact, there's a town uh, uh, called uh, Pawpaw, but you know, the, uh, there's actually a town called Pawpaw in Illinois too, but Illinois banana just doesn't quite have the same ring as Indiana banana. Um, and so you'll see this uh, much more common there. And again, a, a, a very edible uh, kind of delicious fruit. Uh, and I don't know of too many around here. Now, if you do plant yourself a Pawpaw, you're gonna need two of these if you want it to flower and fruit, which I saw a discussion on online recently. So um, we'll stop here. I do want to get to a couple more trees. Um, we've got ourselves a tree lilac here. Another example of, of having a tr species that's got these kind of little dots on the bark. These are lenticels, which help with gas exchange. And so if you see those, there's nothing wrong with that. So cherries, uh, lilacs, uh, we saw the aspens, uh, our first cones that I, that I come to mind that, uh, that have that. So, um, Tell you what, uh, we've got a couple more trees. You know, we generally think of like, oh, fall color flowers. Some trees have really cool bark that allow for year round interest. And let's go check some of those out. And I'm not going to walk backwards so I can kind of make sure we're keeping our distance from people who are otherwise enjoying uh, Garfield Park Conservatory today. And I hope all of you get outside on this beautiful day and weekend uh, as well. I'm one, I go outside all year long, even if it's in the dead of winter, but uh, it, since it's so beautiful out, I hope you all get outside, enjoy yourself some, some trees and other activities. Oh, you know, we've got ourselves a dogwood here. So uh, this is the D of uh, Mad Bucking Horse, our opposite uh, leaf arrangement. See the dogwood here, the leaves are directly across from each other. Um, dogwoods tend to have really beautiful flowers on them, so we, we plant them as species like that. Um, 
I'm trying to think of some other species that we plant. I think we'll see some examples of that. We plant a lot of Kentucky coffee tree that we're going to see. Um, we plant a, we plant sweet gum on occasion, which is what we're. Well, you know what? Let's check out some other trees. Look at this really interesting bark here. This is paper bark maple, and while it's not native. Uh, if you can get it in kind of a sheltered spot, we're south of the conservatory here, so we're blocking the, the northerly winds. A good sheltered spot for something like this. Now, generally speaking, we say don't plant maples because they're overplanted. I would actually make an exception for this one and the next one we're going to see because th these are not especially overplanted. When we think about overplanted maples in particular, we're thinking about uh, Freeman maples, the silver maple red we saw, um, silver maple, Norway maple, red maple. Uh, are, are quite overplanted, but something like this is, is much less common. I would not, I would not tell you to not um, plant this. Just make sure you've got a good situation. So again, what trees should I plant? What's your site? What's your soil? What's your sunlight? Have any overhead obstacles? So a little bit more of an involved question. Um, and this uh, example of a compound leaf as well, where you can see multiple leaflets uh, from, from one bud here. Um, get that. And as long as we're here, the fruit of maple, if you back up just a little bit, the fruit of the maple is a Samara, or maybe you generally refer to them as a helicopter. And depending on the angle of these, you can actually identify maples. Some maples are actually easier to tell from like the bark and the, the fruit than they are the leaves. And we've, oh, you know what? We've got another uh, great example of, oh, here we go. This is actually a, a Japanese maple. Um, it's actually a palmately compound uh, leaf, uh, a simple leaf that's palmately in shape as opposed to the buckeye we saw, which was a compound, uh, palmately compound. Um, and uh, just definitely a, a, a particular variety grown for this, this, this fine texture, this narrow leaf. This again, a really cool, interesting color to it, but I would plant this somewhere where you've got protection from the northerly winds. We're south. Uh, we're just south of the conservatory building itself here. Good, good, safe location for this. Now, this isn't going to grow to be 80 feet tall or something like that. This is always going to be kind of the small um, kind of growth habit, if you will. Sometimes people ask, well, what's the difference between a tree and a shrub? Well, there's no real botanical or, botanical or scientific definition, but we generally consider a tree to have a, a mostly a single trunk, although we'll see some uh, exception to that. Um, growing 12 feet or more tall but again no real hard rigid definition between what's a tree and what's a shrub so uh again for something that's going to have year-round interest uh we do have a river birch here i did promise we'd see a birch and i'm following through on that promise uh, so we we think of uh, oh uh, flowers in the fall um, or i'm sorry flowers in the spring uh leaf change in the fall but you can have trees with year-round interest this uh interesting uh, bark thing that'll be here year-round so that different seasonal interest sometimes birches will have multiple trunks as you can see here uh, as i mentioned earlier birches are something you'll see all along waterways streams lagoons like low wet areas um you know, birches just don't necessarily tend to live all that long uh but birches actually make uh this is another example of that would make a good parkway tree it can handle low uh wet conditions that don't drain particularly well birch would be perfectly happy uh we've got another uh Fine example of Ohio Buckeye behind us here. And again, this palmately compound leaf as it compared to the, the pinnately compound leaf we saw earlier. Uh, that kind of ashy gray, smooth bark. And all oh, the fall color is not, uh, not quite hitting yet on the sweet gum. So we'll see if we can get a little bit of fall color out of this. So we've got a native species here, sweet gum. This is something we're starting to plant a little more because it'll, um, we think of it as a little bit more uh, native to the south of here. But again, with climate change and hotter summers, the sweet gum is going to be perfectly happy with that. In fact, this is so prevalent um, in areas around St. Louis that I learned from uh, our community arborist, Tom. Uh, these are actually a little bit of a nuisance. And the reason for that is it drops the fruits. It drops all sorts of these fruits. Um, and in fact, if we've got any, uh, um, if we've got any, uh, University of Illinois veterans um, alumni. There's all sorts of these on the northern end of the quad there. So these little hardened fruits. Now, if you can imagine hundreds and hundreds of these, a little bit of a nuisance. We don't have them that often here. I do know of a couple that we planted about three years ago in Kelvin Park on the northwest side. Um, roughly, uh, 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 
bright wood uh, west of Pulaski, and the fall color on them is just fantastic. We don't quite have that here yet. Another example of a tree with that X current form, a straight central leader, very well behaved. I do have a personal story of sweet gum. My previous job, before I happily took this one, uh, I had a courtyard window of a building in my previous job, and there was a huge, huge sweet gum outside of that. And the fall color was just a rainbow array of red, orange, yellow. Really cool every fall to have that right outside my, uh, my cubicle window there. Uh, and uh, another thing about sweet gum is uh, it doesn't get a particularly wide crown. It's a pretty narrow crown. And it's got this star-shaped leaf of, oh yeah, here we go, we can get a, very characteristic star-shaped leaf. So you can imagine when the fall color hits, having deep red, deep orange, and yellow of these just all around there, fantastic. In fact, if you're thinking like, well, I, I want to plant a maple, I want to plant a uh, hybrid maple because I like fall color, this would be a great substitute for that. Much less common, uh, not overplanted, help with our diversity, and still get you a fantastic fall color. And then we go see, see the fruit here as well. Um, so, do we have the magic keys to the gate? Fantastic. You want me to do that? <laughs> and we should be right on time to see a couple more species, and I will talk really quickly to make sure we get to all of them. We've got five minutes. And if minutes not, done. they are are on the list and map of trees we've provided. You can find via the link. Oh, there we go. Houdini, I am not. And if we go to my right, Some fantastic fall color. First of all, another sumac here to the fiery red fall color. Uh, oh, and we've even got a little bit of, uh, you see this too. This is actually edible. I've had tree keepers uh, make a sort of lemonade type beverage out of this. Um, so this is staghorn sumac. Uh, again, you'll find this on, uh, let's see, can we get a little, little more shade? Yeah, great. Um, so pioneer species, you'll find it on railroad tracks, other disturbed servants. Uh, I remember seeing this some of uh, up at uh, Fort Sheridan, um, where open lands has some property up there. Uh, and some of the ravines uh, where the golf course used to be, they were just kind of left uh, to nature to take over. And I saw just entire thickets of uh, sumac taking over, doing exactly what sumac does. There is poison sumac. Uh, in the area, I've never actually seen it, so I don't believe it's actually particularly common. But if you see this, this is staghorn sumac. Again, pinnately compound uh, with all these little leaflets. Um, and uh, you know what? To the right here, if we, a uh, little bit of shade. We've got two minutes. All right, I'm going to talk really fast. Um, this is service berry, um, another native wooden we plant quite a bit. This is about as tall as it gets. Uh, service berry is also known as June berry uh, because the fruit, the edible fruit ripens right about June. Birds love it, uh, but humans can do thing, uh, can harvest it needed too. Um, and it's got, a, this is another species with four seasons of interest. Uh, pretty flowers in the spring, um, edible fruit in the, the dark fruit in the summer, uh, this beautiful fall color that's just starting to settle in. Uh, and these uh, vertical stripes on the bark, so four seasons of interest out of this native service berry, and we, that is something we plant. This is about as big as I've ever seen. And I'll tell you what, let's hustle and see uh, one or two more trees. And if you can bear with us a couple extra minutes, we've got, a, we've got a, two more trees that are really worth seeing. Um, the first one we're gonna see is Ginkgo biloba. It was a favorite of tree keeper Jim, who uh, held a version of my job years ago. In fact, he taught the, uh, he taught the tree keepers course when I took it. They, we, uh, a ginkgo was planted in his uh, memory at North Park Village Nature Center, which is another awesome place to go for trees if you get the chance up at uh, about Peterson and Pulaski. This tree is basically a living dinosaur. Um, this is an adapt, this leaf here, this fan-like leaf is actually an adapted needle. And this species is believed to be about 250 million years old. Uh, and it grows these, Adapted needles grow on, if I can find a better example, 
uh, these little kind of little stubs on them. Um, and you will see these. Uh, oh, yeah, there we go. Great. Thanks, Maddie. See, the, the needles actually grow from these kind of stubs here. You, you will see these. In fact, uh, pretty soon, um, the, the year, decades and decades ago, uh, some of the females of these were planted before they realized the fruit can be, uh, let's just say, uh, uh, distinctively aromatic. And you can smell those uh, a couple of blocks away even. Um, and so they, they uh, don't plant those now. But again, you will see these. Uh, the dinosaur of a species, kind of great to have, even though it does not actually support a whole lot of wildlife, actually. But uh, once you get to know that leaf uh, in that kind of branching form, you'll readily be able to identify those. Oh, and we've got to get to our Kentucky coffee tree. This is another native hardy species with a bipinnately compound leaf, which I will attempt to find us an example of. Um, one distinctive characteristic of Kentucky coffee tree is this kind of broken vertical plate to the bark. I've even heard it described as uh, bacon strips. Um, and uh, so if you kind of get to know this, uh, so in the Latin, and I don't expect you to whole lot of, remember a whole lot of Latin names, but it's a gymnocladus dioecious. The gymnocladus, a gymno actually means naked, and that's a reference to the very barren, sparse um, branching structure. And I'm going to grab a leaflet or a leaf here so I can show this to you. Because we yet we have yet to see a bipinnately compound leaf. So Kentucky coffee tree, very hardy, slow growing, um, and will we'll certainly withstand the uh, warming summers of climate change. So for all you young hockey players out there, that is one leaf. So bipinnately compound, we've got the rachii here, and then each of these is a leaflet. So this whole thing is one leaf. And hence Kentucky coffee tree, it's got pods too. Um, only the female plants will have pods, so not every Kentucky coffee tree will have one. Uh, the common name Kentucky coffee tree refers to the fact that you are able to, if you really wanted to, make a bitter coffee-esque beverage out of that. I have not personally done that. I'll, I'll stick with coffee myself. Thank you very much. Um, but hence the common name out of that. Um, and we think about this, this giant, giant leaf here, that, that makes sense why you would have such a barren branching structure. You wouldn't have your branches really close together if you have giant leaves like this. So a really big leaf, uh, a sparse branching structure uh, seems to be a nice complement to each other. Um, and this is sometimes uh, referred to as the energy tree because in the winter when it loses the leaves, it allows the sunlight in to warm things up. And in the summer, it provides a massive amount of shade, which again can help provide, um, the shade can help cool buildings and we can save on energy costs that way. So it provides just a tremendous amount of shade um, when it's got all the leaves on in the winter. So I'll tell you what, any last questions or comments out there? I want to say thank you to uh, Tree Keeper Sarah, who's been monitoring the chat here for Garfield Park Conservatory. Thank you to Tree Keeper Maddie Wilson for uh, walking around with the camera. We do this about four times a year. Uh, thank you for Tree Keeper Lucia with, with Open Lands for coming out and taking pictures. So thank you for everybody for taking the time. Uh, any last questions or comments, more than happy to hear them. Again, check out openlands.org to learn more about tree keepers. Um, Learn more about the African American Water Trail that uh, Tree Keeper, uh, I'm sorry, that Open Land staffer Laura just developed, highlighting the rich uh, history of uh, African American history on the south side of Chicago. Um, check out our advocacy work um, and come to Garfield Park Conservatory as well. Uh, love this place. I'm here probably eight times a year. Uh, any last questions and comments? I am, I am all, uh, all ears. Thanks, Al. I think we can wrap it up. I just want to say thank you. This is Maddie Wilson from Garfield Park Conservatory Alliance. Um, thank you all for joining us. We will be sharing the video um, once we uh, fix all the subtitles. Because if you upload it to um, if you upload it to YouTube, the subtitles are never quite right. So we'll be sharing that in the next couple of weeks. Um, thanks for joining us. We will have a tree ID walk in February. Um, snow or shine or whatever that weather might be. Um, and so we'll have the link to that um, soon. And thank you all for joining us.
Have a great Friday and get outside.